Welcome to the Empowerment Hour podcast, your digital classroom where individuals across all ages, backgrounds, and career levels tune in to get their weekly dose of inspiration and motivation. It's where passion and purpose intersect. I am your host, Nancy Ruffin, the self-proclaimed Latina Oprah, and your very own personal success coach. My goal is to help you discover your purpose and take inspired action so that you create a life where you feel fulfilled and empowered. So if you're ready to start living on purpose, then you're in the right place. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of the Empowerment Hour podcast. It's your girl, Nancy Ruffin, and I am just happy to be here for another week with you all. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for steady rocking with me and just being as loyal as you have been throughout these past 80 plus episodes. Yes. Can you believe that we are like, I want to say this is episode 85 uh, and we're steady growing and you all, you know, are very consistent in letting me know how the podcast is and has helped you. So thank you guys for your feedback. Thank you to all of you as well who have left a review and have rated the show. It means so much because it's through the ratings that we become more visible. And if we're more visible, then that means more people are tuning in. Uh, You know, and I can't grow without having that listenership. And, you know, I owe all that to you guys. So thank you. For this week, I don't have any specific topic um, planned out only because it's been a really heavy week just emotionally. If you've been on social media or listening to the news or any, if you've been paying attention to anything that's been happening recently, it's just been very ugly and it's even hard to enjoy some of the great moments that we may be experiencing in our lives, particularly at this time, right? Because it's June and a lot of our children are graduating school. They're having their moving up ceremonies. It's prom season. It's all of these things that are just really worth, (coughs) excuse me, guys, all of these things really worth celebrating. And yet, when we look at the news, when we look at what this current administration is doing to families, it's just so heavy, you know, and I, for one, celebrated my baby's moving up ceremony, both of them actually, this past week. My oldest is on her way to first grade, and I almost can't believe that she's a six-year-old. I remember just like it was yesterday, me praying for her, praying to become a mother, praying to become pregnant. And here she is six years late, later, just such a vibrant, beautiful, kind, empathetic little girl, um, thriving, you know, and she just makes me so incredibly proud. Then my other little feisty one the youngest one is moving up to pre-k3 they had the cutest little toddler moving up ceremony in her school Um, they put on an actual show and it's weird because when they first informed my husband and i that they were doing this moving up ceremony i was like what in the world can two-year-olds possibly do but i was pleasantly surprised they sang songs And they recited their ABCs. uh, And it was just the cutest little thing. And she was so, so proud of her graduation, which is what she kept saying. And, you know, and I look at my own children and I think about all of the pride that I have when I look at them and all of the dreams that I have for them, you know, to really just 
be grow up to be amazing young girls and to follow their dreams whatever they may be and you know to go to college if that's what they want and to just kind of go after whatever their heart calls them to do and i think that for most parents we do have all of these dreams you know for our children and i think that this week has been particularly just difficult for many of us because we see how this administration has really, you know, buckled down on their immigration policy and they have like this zero tolerance for anyone who's crossing our border and in a way and I guess um as a way to make their point, you know, they have started separating families at the border. So for those you know, refugees or immigrants who are crossing our borders illegally once they get stopped, you know, on American soil uh, and they fail to produce, you know, papers, um, they are being ripped apart or torn apart from their children. And I think there's something like over 3,000 children who have been separated from their parents and have been detained in these warehouses. They're reporting that, you know, there's like even an abandoned Walmart that they are using to detain these children. They're housing them in cages, you know, these wired fences. And children as young as, you know, two years old, infants, toddlers, you know, none older than my own baby and that breaks my heart because when I look at her and I see how attached she is to my husband and I, I could not imagine the trauma she would be feeling should she ever be taken from me and placed in God knows where with God knows who, amongst strangers, you know, who have no emotional connection or attachment to her and could care less about her safety, her well-being, whether she's eating, um, whether she's being, you know, changed, her diaper being changed, you know, um, within a certain amount of time so that she doesn't get diaper rashes. and she, It's just so so heartbreaking. I can't even allow myself to think about it for too long without tearing up because those children don't have to be my children for me to feel empathy, to feel compassion, to know that what this administration is doing is wrong. And they are willing to do and use anything and anyone to push their political agenda. And I think that we all, as American citizens, should really be concerned on how this administration is going about uh, running this country, because I feel like we are regressing, you know, decades and what took, you know, our ancestors and those who came before us, you know, years and years of, of fighting and dying for um in just a short amount of time this president is taking us back um and i'm just afraid to see what we will look like as a country at the end of his four year term if we you and me and everyone else in this country um doesn't act like we are not at a point in history where we can kind of just sit back and do nothing and hope that our next, you know, our neighbor or fellow American um, is doing something, right? We can't count on other people to push this country forward in order for us to make sure that we don't go back to what we had or lose all of the progress that was made. We each have to do our part. There is no way that we can allow 
this president and his administration to justify their inhumanity and the things that they are doing in the name of, you know, country, right? Because we know that his whole platform was built on making America great again. But when we think about the history of this country, when has this country ever truly been great for people of color, for minorities, for anyone who is not male, white, and straight? And I posted this as a status update on my Facebook you know, a few days ago, maybe about a week ago. And a really good friend of mine, um, someone who I love dearly, who is white and he is gay and he is just one of the most magnificent human beings that I am honored to know. But he, you know, he almost criticized the statement and um, what he said to me was that, you know, that I need, I guess I need to be careful with what I say because we don't want to alienate um white straight males because that they haven't always had it easy either um and so someone else had commented i guess in my defense that what they thought i meant was the privilege that white straight males have in this country um and to that extent i would say that you know that they are right you know white straight males have a certain privilege just by the fact that they're white and they're straight and they're males, right? Because they have never had to fight for anything, really, when it comes to equality, right? The fact that they're white, the fact that they're male, the fact that they're straight automatically um, removes them from having to to fight or seek equality where the rest of us, unfortunately, do not have that privilege, right? And so and while I... You know, and maybe you as well, we may have, you know, different sort of privileges, but at the end of the day, when it all comes down to it, we are still minorities. We are still people of color. I am still a woman. You know, I have all of these other things that my gender and my race and my ethnicity and just by everything, um, I've had to fight for. And maybe not me specifically, but people who look like me, right? Nothing that, no right or privilege that I enjoy today um, was one that was given to me. It was one that had to be fought for. So the fact that I can vote in our elections, you know, I owe a great deal to the women before me who voted, or not who voted, but who fought for women to get the right to vote. Um, And it's just, I don't know, it, it... it, this country has never been great um, for us. And so while this country has gotten better, I can't say that we have ever been a nation that has lived up to um, our constitution, right? And when we think about what Trump is doing with these immigrant families and you know, expressing and highlighting that they're breaking the law and that they're here illegally. Um, And while all of that, yes, um, very well may be true. At what point, though, do we allow our politics to trump, for lack of a better word, our humanity, right? At what point is it politics and love of country more important than traumatizing these children by separating them from their families just because you want to prove a point because you can and because you're in a position of power to do so and yes i understand that this law has been a law um for years right it was a law when obama was in office it was a law when clinton was in office and yes i get that it was a law but no one has been enforcing it the way that this president has and he's doing it to prove a point and i think that we can no longer just sit idle and allow him to tear this country apart because that's exactly what he's doing i mean in the short time that he's been in office we can see how racial tension 
has increased in this country. People be- feel more empowered and emboldened to be disrespectful, you know, to people of color and to tout, you know, the, those red hats that make America great again and, um, you know, to kind of rub it in our faces almost. And we cannot allow this country to go back to a time where there was segregation and there was the belief that one race is superior than another. And while, yes, I know that um, I think Trump really just allowed these people to reveal themselves, right? Um, I know that they existed before, but they were very careful. Now they just don't give a shit and they're out there and they're in your face and they feel like they can say and do whatever they want because they have this president, you know, who isn't afraid to tell it how it is, right? Because that's what many people applaud Trump for because he's not the normal politician. He doesn't give a shit what comes out of his mouth. He says whatever he feels like and no matter who it offends. Um, And I get, I'm just, I'm just angry. I'm sad, you know, and for those of you um, who live in the New York City tri-state area, um, you're also aware that this city has been kind of dealing with another tragic loss Uh, A young man, a young 15-year-old boy, Bronx boy, um, was viciously and brutally um, butchered and murdered right, I want to say, on his block in a local bodega that, according to his mom, the owners of that store um, had known him for his entire life. And, uh, you know, a group of five men uh, attacked this young man and they dragged him out of the bodega, which he went into seeking refuge, right? Hoping that the men in the store would help him. And instead, they did nothing. They just stood there and watched as a group of five adult men with machetes and knives butchered and killed him. Okay, and then they left him for dead and the poor boy, people all around him, no one helping. All they did was whip out their cell phones to record it. The freaking boy managed to take his bloody body one block to the local hospital where he collapsed and died before even making it inside. And when I tell you that this story has rocked me to the core. I am so heartbroken for this young man, for what his last moments on earth must have been for him, how terrified he must have been. I can't even report on this story without physically choking up. I just feel so, so, so sad. I feel so angry. My heart breaks for his mother. I don't know how how does a parent how do you bury a child? Even more so when his life was taken from him. And even more so when you find out that it was a case of mistaken identity. He was not even the intended target, but because he looked like the other young man that they were looking for. They murdered him, a 15-year-old boy with his whole life ahead of him. He had dreams of becoming a detective. He was enrolled in a, an explorer's program, um, you know, for, I guess, you know, for, for individuals that were interested in becoming police officers. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, this was a good kid. Right, and not saying that any kid um, deserves to be murdered and butchered in that way, but this was not a kid who was in the street. He was not involved in any gangs. He was not one of these kids, you know, out looking for trouble. He was a good kid, you know, being raised by a mom doing her best, you know, to raise her children. Um, But these streets, man, these streets don't give a shit. They don't care about how good your kids are. They don't care about how hard you work. 
you know, to give your children the best and to protect them and to, you know, and to raise them into being kind and empathetic children. The streets don't care. And it's such an unfortunate reality. Uh, And it breaks my heart because this young man is just one story among thousands. Okay, the stories like this happen all across the country. And it's just the fucking luck of the draw, man. It just depends on where you were born, where you live, what your community is like. You know, when I think about this young boy um, and how he was murdered, um, I think about my own cousin who, when I was 16 and he was 15, um, was murdered as well. You know, he was gunned down uh, at broad daylight. Um, you know, on a very busy avenue. And while my cousin, God rest his soul, may he rest in peace, who I love dearly because he was like my brother, he was not one of these good kids, right? He was not like Junior. He was a young man who unfortunately was a product of his environment. And so he was a bully. He was what many would classify as a bad kid. Um, But again, he wasn't born that way, right? But it was the circumstances that he was born into, right? Unfortunately, his mother was addicted to drugs. May she rest in peace because she also died a few years ago um, because of all of the stuff that she did to herself. Years of drug use, years of alcoholism, um, you know, and she was probably one of the biggest drug addicts in our neighborhood. Um, and that was what he had as a mom. And his father, um, you know, had, for all intents and purposes, had abandoned him, had moved, I believe, to Puerto Rico and had started like a new family. And so my cousin had no father figure. He had a mom who was addicted to drugs. His grandmother did the best she could to raise him, but. You know, by that point, he was already a lost kid. He was uncontrollable. And there was no one who could really contain this kid. And, you know, he he got lost to the streets. um, And as a result, the streets ended up taking his life. Um, And not that he deserved it. Of course, I loved him. And so um, when he died, I remember just cursing the young man who took his life and asking God why him but you know at the end of the day I think he created um his own karma right he did a lot of people he was bad to a lot of people he hurt a lot of people and so when you live your life in that way it's only a matter of time when people seek revenge and so that was what happened in his case but nonetheless he was a boy himself he was 15 years old um and i think had he had the proper upbringing and the proper um, role models that his life could have turned out differently you know, but again, it's the luck of the draw and it just depends on where you're born and, and the life that you're born into, man. And it also depends on your will, right? The will that you have either to take yourself out of your circumstance or you succumb to it. And for poor Junior, you know, I think that he was aspiring to greatness. I think that he realized that he knew where he came from and that was not the future he wanted for himself, which was why he probably, you know, aspired to be a detective. And, you know, his mom worked at the hospital that he died in as a housekeeper. So this is a woman, you know, who was making an honest living to take care of her kids. And these five pieces of shit who are probably products of their own environment, right? These are gang members. And who knows what... A child or what a person, you know, is going through personally that in their minds, they feel the need to join a gang, 
right? Because what you know, what, what do you get when you're a gang? It's like um, that that sense of family, right? Somebody's down for you. You're down for each other, right? And so those boys or those men or, or these killers. Who knew what demons that they've been battling, you know? And so I think that we just have to do better as people, as fellow humans. And, you know, for you parents out there, do better by your children, man. Show them love. Show them kindness. Give them, you know, give them what they need so that they don't go out into the street looking for it. Okay? Don't let the streets control your kids, take a hold of your kids, because once they fall victim to that, it's so hard to get them back. And we just have to do better. We have to start practicing love. You know, this this hate that is just permeating our world and all around us, it's just, it's going to kill us. It's going to kill all of us. Um, and this world is going to be a sad, sad place to live in if we don't do something and if we're not proactive. Um, and yeah, so I guess this is going to end this week's um, episode. I really just wanted to get some of the stuff off my chest. I wanted to talk about it. I know that many of you, um, you know, are, are feeling the same way that I am. I see your social media posts. I I see the things that you, you know, respond to me and message me about. And I just want you guys to know that, you know, you're not alone. I'm here. We're all here. Um, we just have to be there for each other. Because in the end, that's all we have. All we have is each other. So I challenge you all, you know, as you step out into the world, um, just try to do something kind for a stranger. Okay, do something that's unexpected. Um, Kindness goes a long way. And if they ask how they can repay you or why you're doing it, just tell them you're trying to change the vibration of the world and tell them to pay it forward. You do something kind for someone, they do something kind for someone else. And if we live our lives in this way, then maybe we can start making some change. So until next time, mi gente, go out there, love each other, and crush those goals.